Good afternoon and welcome to today's Museum of Science live program. Every year, our current science and technology team makes their picks for the 10 most exciting, influential, important, and coolest stories from the world of science for the last 12 months. This year has been very different in so many ways, but we still wanted to share our list with you, which we will be doing all January long. In a moment, I'll be joined by three of my fellow Museum of Science educators, and we'll start our countdown today with our picks for number 10 and number nine. And then each Wednesday in January, we'll be back with a live stream to reveal the next few entries counting down all the way to our number one story of the year at the end of the month. My name is Eric, my pronouns are he, him, and I'll be the moderator during this session, which means I'll be fielding all the questions that you ask our panelists. Please do begin asking questions about our stories or the process of how we selected them at any time. You to ask a question on Zoom, just press the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and include your name and age if you'd like a shout out. If you'd like to see captions on Zoom, you can click on the closed captions button at the bottom of your screen and select show captions. And if you're joining us on Facebook or YouTube, you won't be able to see your questions or comments, but we are happy that you're tuning in. So at this point, I'd like to invite my panelists to turn on their cameras and introduce themselves, and we'll be ready to get started. Hello. Uh, hi, everybody. Welcome to our top 10 countdown. My name is Karen, one of the many educators at the museum, and super excited to start our science countdown of 2020. Me too. My name is Megan. I use the pronoun she, hers, also an educator at the Museum of Science. And this is like a highlight of my year every year. Um, and so happy that we're able to do it. And I'm Sarah. My pronouns are also she and her. And yeah, this is the most wonderful time of the year for those of us who love talking about science. And so uh, I'm ready. Let's jump into it. So every year we sift through probably about 100 stories from the world of science and technology to pick out our top 10. Every year there's a story that just doesn't quite make the cut for our list, but we hang on to it and we wanted to share it with you anyway. So let's dive in. Megan, can you tell us about this year's honorable mention story? Absolutely. Uh, so I am so honored to share our honorable mention story this year, and I'm gonna share our slides uh, in just a moment. Beautiful, because our honorable mention uh, is quite the story. I know, and it's adorable. I, I'm so happy to share these photos with you. So it goes out to our beloved animal, arguably one of the weirdest animals here on planet Earth, the duck-billed platypus. So the duck-billed platypus is a really weird animal. Like I said, it's weird for a lot of reasons that we already know about, right? Is that it has this like crazy duck bill. Um, it is sort of semi-aquatic. It's a mammal, so it has hair, it produces milk, yet it is egg laying, making it a monotreme. Um, it has webbed feet. It has a beaver-like tail. It has, uh, males have spurs on their back legs that are loaded with venom. I could literally go on and on about all the weird things about this animal. And yet somehow researchers found this year that they are even weirder than we thought. And it is because they found that platypuses biofluoresce. And this is exactly what it looks like. So this is a pelt of a platypus um, and it is glowing blue green under UV light. So biofluorescence is when an animal's skin or uh, tissues absorb ultraviolet light or UV light from the sun and then re-emits it as another color, often like a red or orange, or in this case, a uh, sort of greenish blue hue. Um, so this is actually fairly common in the animal kingdom. I don't know, Karen and Sarah, do you like, can you think of any animals that you know of that we know that biofluoresce? Well, we do at the museum have uh, scorpions and we often do the demonstration where we shine a UV light on our scorpions to show how they glow sort of white um, in, uh, in UV light, but like you really can't see it. So this is, you would be able to see this green if you, it, it's not like a photo thing. It's like, if you shown a UV light, this, so weird. Why? <laughs> and I remember a couple years ago, there was a group of researchers that were researching on the coral reefs and they, whatever, were doing it at night. So they had UV lights and they came across a sea turtle and realized that sea turtle shells, um, I think it was specifically the green sea turtle, um, like fluoresce under UV light, which is weird. And I don't know that it gave us a reason or we figured out a reason why the sea turtles biofluoresce. Um, can you think of any reasons would help platypus, Megan? 
Yeah. So let me even tell you just how they figured this out because it was really sort of happen chance is that really didn't think that very many mammals biofluoresced at all. It didn't even seem like it was worthy of our attention because it was mostly in other groups like reptiles or uh, invertebrates or fish, a lot of animals that live in the water. But there are a couple mammals that they knew of, of the flying squirrel and possums that were known to biofluoresce. But that was kind of where we stopped. It seemed like that was all the mammals. But a researcher was at the Field Museum in Chicago and decided to go a little rogue and happened to be by the monotreme drawer, which includes, again, the platypuses and the echidnas, those egg-laying mammals, and was like, "Mm, let's give it a try. Let's just go ahead and shine some UV light over there. And they found that both the males and the females biofluoresce. So it was kind of just like a little bit of curiosity uh, opened like a whole door. Now, as far as why, That seems to be still a mystery, needing some more research along with a lot of things about the platypus. Uh, They're pretty elusive animals. They seem to be pretty confident that it doesn't have anything to do with communication because platypuses don't really use their eyesight. So why would they use this color to communicate with one another? That would be a very visual cue. Doesn't make a lot of sense. As well as reproduction, both the male and female pelts had the same coloration, same Mm. pattern, the same brightness. So it likely has nothing to do with reproduction or courtship. The most likely thing is that it's to camouflage. And so they camouflage in visible light with their brown fur and then in UV with this ability to biofluoresce because some of their predators, say like a bird of prey, can actually see in UV. So it's maybe a chance to camouflage. It also could very well be none of those things and actually have like little to no purpose. And it could just be this sort of ancestral lingering trait that was maybe useful a long time ago and now is just sort of a cool fun fact. I mean, I guess like we've seen it in mammals. Sea turtles and scorpions and flying squirrels and opossums that all biofluoresce and we know why any of them biofluoresce. Like maybe you're right. Maybe it is just this stigil like ancestral gene that is still in a lot of animals' bodies that doesn't serve a purpose today, but doesn't serve any harm, but wouldn't have evolved out of their genetic line. Right. I just, that's a, from what I read, it was mostly camouflage, but that's that's a good question. I like the idea of a scientist trying to figure this out in the field and walking around Australia at night with a giant UV light trying to spot a platypus <laughs> to like see their behavior and, and how it changes it. That's literally yeah, what the researchers said is really that big now I should include it. Yeah. Right. Big old UV <laughs> like spotlight. search lamps where you're like, where are the platypuses? I guess they right. can shine this uh, UV light and exactly. pop out of their dark uh, habitat maybe. Yeah. And what's sort of the the last cool thing about this is that it was really surprising. So it like sort of has opened the door a little bit to go like, what else should we shine a UV light on? And so there was another cool story that followed this. Us? No. Humans? Do we glow? <laughs> Maybe we're fluorescent. We don't know. <laughs> That's So the, the Toledo Zoo looked at their Tasmanian devils. They had a researcher come in and shine mm. a UV light on them um, and found that parts of the Tasmanian devil, which is an animal that's also from Australia, uh, also biofluoresce. So it's sort of just like opening the door to be like, what else should we look at? Maybe mammals actually do this more often than we initially thought. Cool. One reason why I love our honorable mentions, just the real fun, like, it's not hard science. It's just fun science. Just fun science. Exactly. Well, again, if you have any questions on the stories, even ones we've moved on from, we can always go back. We'll have time for questions at the end. But kicking off our countdown proper is our number 10 story, which played across most of our calendar year for 2020. Karen, you were by far the biggest supporter of this one in our (laughs) pitching for our top 10 when we decided what the stories were. Why don't we spin into our countdown with you telling us about number 10? Awesome. I had to argue pretty heartily for this one, um, but I am a huge weather buff. I have loved paying attention what's the local weather, what's the climate worldwide for many years. So of course, the 2020 Atlantic uh, hurricane season was very exciting and noteworthy to me. Um, And thankfully, I convinced all my coworkers to go along with it and uh, talk a little bit about why it was such a record breaking year. So I want to introduce you to the 2020 class of 2020 Atlantic hurricane season. There's a lot to unpack here. You can see in this map. Whoa. Yeah. And all the names coming up. And done. There were 30 named storms, which is a record. You can see those paths that they took. There were some weird paths this year of the hurricanes. You can see some that just kind of curved right up off the coast of Africa, up towards Europe. 
Um, but I want to take you through sort of what the records were. We're just going to kind of go through step by step, say a few things about them, and then we'll see if any of my other panelists or any of you watching have any questions about it, because it is certainly a fascinating season. So to start off, it was the most active season in recorded history of the Atlantic hurricanes. There were 30 named storms. Uh, the next closest was back in 2005 with 28 named storms. That year was also memorable because in September of 2005 is when the very catastrophic Hurricane Katrina hit Louisiana. Um, next to, or I should say behind 2005, this was only the second time that we actually had to use the Greek alphabet. So every year there's uh, a slate of 21 named storms. We sort of take out the X's and like these and some other strange letters that don't have as many names to go along with them. And then if you run out of those, you have to go to the Greek alphabet. Um, and we just name them off alpha, beta, so on and so forth. But this was the only second time that that happened. Typically in average hurricane season, or I should say a tropical cyclone season, we have about 12 named storms. This year we had 30. Um, of those 30, 13 of them developed into hurricanes, um, which means they have reached that category one status, which is 74 miles per hour of sustained winds. To be a named storm, you only have to have 39 mile per hour sustained winds. Six of them were major hurricanes, which means they reached category three, four, or five. Only one actually reached that top category. That was extra noteworthy because it was the final named storm, Iota, in November, and it was the first time we've ever had a Category 5 in the month of November. 12 storms made landfall here in the U.S., breaking a 1916 record of only nine storms. Six of these were hurricanes, so it wasn't just tropical storms hitting the U.S. coast, but six of them were hurricanes, and five of those storms, both hurricane and tropical storms, for Louisiana alone. Um, 10 of these tropical cyclones underwent what we call rapid intensification. This just means they rapidly increased their power, wind speeds. In fact, um, Hurricane Eta increased its wind speeds by 80 miles per hour in one day. So rapid, rapid intensification of several of the storms. September, also busiest on record with 10 named storms. And there were actually two pre-season storm. So the season doesn't officially start until June 1st and goes through November 30th. There were two uh, storms, A and B, came all the way back in May. So a lot of storms, a lot of records, a lot of really interesting things that happened. And just one other noteworthy thing, this is a map. Over the course of the entire year, almost every single bit of U.S. coastline from Texas to Maine was under a tropical storm watch or a hurricane watch or warning. There was one county in the panhandle of Florida that never had a watch or a warning. So I guess they're the lucky ones. Um, so it was a very busy 2020 when it comes to tracking those tropical storms. Yeah, it seems like we've had this story a couple times lately where it was just a really intense season. Um, can you talk, Karen, a little bit about some of the patterns that we've seen and why maybe this was such a really intense season with lots of storms? Yeah, so there are a couple of things that uh, we're sort of looking at what caused it to be such an incredible season. One of them had to do with the fact that right at the start of the season, the surface temperature of the ocean was abnormally high. So basically, over the course of last winter and spring, the ocean just didn't cool off much or didn't cool off as much. So nice, warm, tropical waters is what fuels hurricanes. So you'll notice most of them start sort of just north of the equator, and then they move um, across the Atlantic. So that was one reason, abnormally high sea surface temperatures. The second one is that by um, sort of mid to late summer, there was a huge monsoon, monsoon season happening in Northwest Africa. And these monsoons basically primed the atmosphere to help develop really strong storms in the Atlantic. And lastly, actually this takes us to the Pacific Ocean, there was a La Nina event. So a La Nina event is just cooling, natural cooling of the Pacific Ocean. It actually reduces wind shear. So up in the upper levels of the atmosphere, the way the wind is moving. And by reducing the wind shear, it allowed Atlantic hurricanes to sort of spike. 
Um, when there's a lot of wind shear, those storms can't develop over the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but with the La Nina event, it primed it again, primed that atmosphere, some really great storms. Thankfully, it was not one of the most destructive or deadly seasons that we have had when it comes to tropical storms and hurricanes. There was, yes, a lot of damage where it made landfall. There were some, um, you know, loss of human life and buildings. Thankfully, it was not, that was not one of the records for 2020. Yeah, I, it, a lot of hurricane damage has to do with exactly where it hits, even though the storms are hundreds of miles wide, where you have that most intense damage is really close to the highest winds right next to the eye. And I was surprised to read that Louisiana had its strongest hurricane to hit it in something like 100 years or ever. Yeah. And you think, well, what about Hurricane Katrina? And that was, it was also really, really strong, but it also happened to hit at exactly the spot right by New Orleans to cause levees to overflow and cause a lot of damage and a lot of destruction. Yeah, yeah. crazy. Hurricanes are so fascinating to study. Um, as I said, I'm a huge weather buff. I love learning more about it, but they can be quite deadly. And I have to say, the 2020 pandemic did not make it any easier with where it comes to evacuations and safety, um, removing people and property from the coastlines. We got a question from Susan. Do you think 2021 will have a lot of hurricanes and storms too? A great question. Um, in my research, uh, climate scientists aren't thinking that this necessarily gives us any insight into what might ha happen in future hurricane seasons, but the fact that the ocean temperatures are increasing overall, fact, one of the factors had to do with the sea surface temperature being so high. I mean, it probably will fuel more hurricanes and tropical cyclones in the future. And I feel like whenever we talk about hurricanes, we always have to mention climate change as something that affects so many different systems on the earth. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to talk a little bit about how it's so hard to say for sure that a hurricane or even a season can be directly attributed to climate change. Yeah, I know that's something we talked about a couple of years ago that uh, although hurricanes are of course part of earth's climate and earth's weather systems, they are, as I'm sure you got that impression from what Karen was saying, like. <laughs> There are so many different things that go into what causes them. So whether part of the ocean is warmer or cooler at different times of the year, how certain currents work, how much dust is in the atmosphere. So hurricanes are such complex systems that like, it is really hard to just, you can't look at one example and say, oh, that predicts everything out. And that's kind of what's hard about climate science anyway, is that you have to accumulate data over decades and compare what you have. And you know, that's, that's sort of where we are now with hurricanes. Yeah, we've got a lot of, you know, there's a lot of destruction with hurricanes. It's something we have to live with on the earth, but I'm always kind of hopeful because we have the technology to observe them, predict them, understand them. Um, I was reading a couple of years ago about the new satellites they have and they can get the data down quickly and they can track the eye of the hurricane where it's relatively calm with such accuracy in real time that one of the hurricanes, I think Harvey a couple of years ago that hit Texas, they were able to coordinate with rescue workers on the ground to give them the exact 20 minute window when the yeah. eye wall would pass over. And they did thousands of rescues of people who were trapped by rising floodwaters in that 20 minute window. And they knew exactly when they had to be back inside to stay safe before the intense winds came back. And so yeah, it's, it's something that- Technology is so amazing. And so I wanted I to finish with a, a question about that to you, Karen. Uh, some of the technology that is most interesting to me is the Hurricane Hunter planes that fly mm. right through the eye wall. Um, this year, I looked it up, there were 86 missions in the Atlantic, dropping 2,000 probes, flying through hurricanes 100 times. If you had a chance, would you fly in one of those through a hurricane? Uh, have they ever crashed? Not that I was able to see. Not this year. Put me on <laughs> it. Uh, I, will, I will do it. I, I volunteer for tribute. Love Put me it. on the hurricane plane, and I will fly through a hurricane. I am that much of a weather buff. I will cheer you on from home. <laughs> yeah, me too. I will, I will uh, like Zoom with you guys from the plane. Right? It'll be great. Perfect. It's like from there. Um, and I did see a question in, in the chat there about what was the biggest hurricane. I can't remember what the biggest hurricane, but there was a huge typhoon, so Pacific. Um, I don't know, was that four or five years ago, guys, that we reported on it? And that was the most massive at that point in time. Um, it was, it struck Philippines? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. 
Um, Can you really, remind us which ones we saw in Massachusetts this year? Were there any ones that- For hurricanes? I'm trying to, yeah. I don't know that we had any that, we had some that were off the coast. We had some that brought us like rain. We definitely didn't have any hurricanes. We haven't had a hurricane hit Massachusetts coast since- Sandy? Uh, Sandy? Oh. Sandy, by the time it got here, it was no longer a hurricane, I'm pretty confident. Mm. Um, I think it was all the way back in 1991, 92 with Hurricane Bob. Um, but I remember clearly because we didn't know it was coming until we were on our way home from our camping trip and listened to the car radio. And it's like, Hurricane Bob is arriving tomorrow. And we're like, ooh. So thankfully, we don't live near the coast. And we're no longer in a tent. Right, we've got one more entry for today, and it's from the domain of archaeology. So, Sarah, can you take us back a few thousand years and give voice to our number nine story? I sure can. Uh, so our number nine story in our countdown today is probably one of my favorite science stories that happened this year, even though it's this high on the countdown. Um, this is this happened early January 2020. So I've had this in my bookmarks for a long time. Uh, and this is about a mummy. Uh, a specific mummy, in fact, quite a famous mummy who's very well known. The sarcophagus is shown here. It's very, very well preserved. Uh, the mummy's name is Nessia Moon. Uh, and he died around 3,000 years ago, was mummified. And uh, this is a sort of reconstruction of what we believe his face looked like there. And then on the side, those hieroglyphs are what are inscribed on his coffin lid. And they translate to an epithet, which is true of voice. So Nessia Moon was a priest and incense bearer and uh, spoke to the gods on behalf of the ancient Egyptians. That was their belief. Now he's known as the Leeds mummy. He's been at the University of Leeds for over 200 years, was actually the only mummy to survive the uh, blitz of, of uh, Leeds during World War II and has been there ever since. Um, and the reason we're talking about him now is because some researchers did a really, really cool experiment that had to do with his voice. Now, what we see here is Nessia Moon out of his sarcophagus, but still in his wrappings, uh, getting ready to undergo some scans to get a very, very clear view of the inside of his body, specifically from about right here to about right here, because what they're interested in is the part of his body that makes a voice. So the human vocal tract goes from technically the bottom of our lungs all the way up to our nose and lips. Uh, that's all that we use to make the many, many sounds that we make for language. Uh, but in this case, they just 3D printed from the pharynx all the way up through the lips of Nessia Moon. Now they were able to do this because he is so well preserved. He's one of the best preserved mummies of all time. And so because he was so perfectly mummified, they were able to recreate, this is a 3D printing of his throat uh, and mouth attached to the speaker box from an ice cream truck. It didn't play sound. It was just to make a noise to sort of just pass to vibrate uh, in the same way that the larynx or the voice box in the human does. And so they did this all to basically pass some sounds through this vocal tract and, and see what they sounded like. I do have the sound and I'll get to it in a second. Uh, but before we get to the sound, I do want to ask if any of my educators have questions. I have a question about what it is made of. Like, like that material was, or it was 3D printed. Like what material did they choose to make it as accurate as possible? Yeah, great question. So they used some of the sort of newest 3D printing technology that allows uh, when you are forming plastic, they're able to form the plastic without fiber. So instead, uh, they're printing layer by layer, building little polymers instead of using a single fiber to wipe to wrap around. That was really important in this case because the pharynx is also a single stable piece of tissue. Uh, there's no like holes or anything in it. In fact, it's it's like pretty important for the purpose of bringing air to our lungs that it be airtight. So they needed to make an airtight pharynx in order to really recreate how, how uh, sounds would move through there. That's really cool. Uh, we got a question in from Bradford. When was he alive? Can you go uh, give us that date again? Yeah, absolutely. So we don't know exactly what age he was when he died. Uh, he was an adult. He looked to be an older adult. So um, he died, uh, he was mummified around 1100 BCE, so about 3,100 years ago. Uh, that's when he was mummified. We're not 100% sure what he died of. Interestingly enough, um, his organs are missing. So there's not really a way, I mean, they're not missing. We know where they are, they're in canopic jars, uh, but they're not in his uh, body anymore. And so therefore we haven't been able to like do an autopsy, but it seems like he died at a pretty standard older adult age uh, in around 1100 BCE. He's a very famous priest. And so he was mummified. 
just think it's so cool. We were talking about technology that allows us to better study hurricanes, but the fact that we don't have to destroy this artifact, yeah. uh, this human artifact, in order to learn more about what it may have sounded like, what it may have looked like. Um, I was just reading an article in National Geographic about how we're using the same or similar types of technology to look deeper at fossils. So going yeah. back even like many millions of years, um, being able to tell what some of the colors of dinosaur eggs were. Um, and right. it actually, spoiler alert, sounds like they may have had some colors like modern day birds. Like they weren't just sort of, you know, gray and drab, but had brilliant colors as well, which just find technology is so amazing what we can do now that we couldn't do 10 years ago, 50 years ago, or 300 years ago. So before we get to the sound, we did get someone asking, as always is the case, what are the applications of this? Why would someone want to do this? What else could it lead to? Yeah, good question. Uh, first off, any sort of 3D printing of human body parts is part of an ongoing sort of uh, a trend toward better being able to solve the organ crisis. So that is one sort of thing. However, this is also just a huge archaeological application. As Karen said, this is a non-invasive way to do incredibly thorough anatomical reconstructions of ancient humans, which is something that we, we really, really need, uh, especially when it comes to mummification. That's a unique opportunity. That is a body that has been preserved in tissue that has been preserved in a way that was meaningful to that society. Uh, and in the case of this one, the, Eng the ancient Egyptian language has been a huge source of mystery for a long time. The Rosetta Stone is what allowed us to decrypt that. But in order to better understand what a spoken language was like and how that affected uh, you know, the society, what it would have sounded like in the, in the temples and the pyramids of, of Egypt. He was not in the Great Pyramids, he was at Karnak, which is uh, another sort of uh, pretty fairly well-known Egyptian city and site of mummies. But um, this is, uh, so this is part of a, an ongoing trend towards like better thorough reconstructions of what humans were like. It's also just a really, really great way of using, using what we have. So yeah, with no further, let's, humans, let's go. Humans are curious about so much, whether it's, you know, can we get to the next planet out there or can we find out what our ancient ancestors sounded like? Yep. So with all that to build up, they really just made one vowel sound from the mummy. <laughs> uh, they plan to do more. Um, and that's part of why I love the story is because this sound is so triumphant. Um, all right, everyone ready? Let's do one more time. So it's a vowel, it's a vowel sound eh, same as you would get from pet or bed. Uh, and, uh, and yeah. yeah I'm not sure the sound came through. Did anybody else not hear it either? Maybe, maybe unshare and reshare? Let me try again. Let me try again. We'll maybe that your computer sound wasn't coming through. Okay, we'll try one more time. Eh. There we go. Okay, there it is. Eh. 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 So there you have it. There's the, what the mummy had to say was a vowel, but hopefully there is more in the future about what we can get from, Ness, uh, from Nessia Moon, true voice. Sound of a 3000 year old priest. <laughs> well, that is about all the time we have for today's program. I want to invite all of our educators to say goodbye. Thanks Bye. guys. Thank you. Hopefully we'll uh, see you back here next week. So be sure to tune in each Wednesday in January at this time as we reveal the rest of our picks from the top 10 science stories of 2020 to wrap up what we had today. Our honorable mention story is that the duck platypus in fact glows at biofluorescence. It uh, has fluorescence. The number 10 story is the very active 2020 hurricane season. And our number nine story was the recreation of a voice of a 3000 year old mummy. So I'd like to thank all of you for tuning in and asking such amazing questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to every single one. We've got lots of other digital content for you to enjoy from other live streams to our podcast to our short science videos. You can follow us on social media or check out mos.org slash mos at home and see what else we're up to. If you enjoyed today's presentation, please visit engage.mos.org slash welcome to support mos at home. Thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you next week.